Welcome to Questions and Vancers, a van talk podcast with Field Van, where we delve into the world of van life and overlanding. We're here in the factory in a van, and in this episode, we sit down with a former founder of Sportsmobile West, a company that specializes in building custom vans for outdoor enthusiasts. Join us as we take a trip down memory lane and learn about the early days of the business, the challenges and successes along the way, from the legendary Rally in the Valley to the Overland Expos. We cover it all. So buckle up and let's hit the road with our guest and my dad, Alan Feld. Welcome to Questions and Vancers. This is a Van Talk podcast presented by Field Van. I'm Johnny Feld, and next to me I have our first guest, my dad, Alan Feld. He's one of the OGs of van life of van camping overlanding um yeah tell everyone how you learned you were an og well we were up at a (laughs) show up in bend oregon and people kept saying oh here's the og and introducing and getting pictures and everything i thought it was old guy you know (laughs) that's how old i am and uh, i think mandy from illuminous uh mom asked you know what's with the og thing and she goes oh that's original gangster original so i've I've been called worse so (laughs) i I was okay with that once i found out what it was i remember getting the call and they're saying yeah we call ogs original gangsters i was like that's a good thing dad don't worry about it yeah because usually i was younger than our customers now i'm older than them so i felt (laughs) i'm okay yeah, so they got started back in 1989 doing the van life, but let's start at the beginning. So you were born in Alabama. Aniston, to... Alabama on Fort McClellan on a military base. My dad was a colonel and we moved, I think, every time the rent was due. <laughs> so we li- I was born in Alabama. We moved to Japan. We moved back to Alabama. We moved to Philadelphia. We moved to uh, Stuttgart, Germany, Heidelberg, Germany. So pretty much all around. Every time the rent was due, we moved. Yeah, so growing up in the Army, yeah, traveling a lot. And uh, yeah, I know you had that entrepreneurial spirit at a young age. I remember hearing a story. Yeah, remind me of the selling pretzels. Yes. (laughs) So we were on uh, base Frankfurt Arsenal in Pennsylvania. And I believe I was nine years old and my first job after school, mom would take me down and we'd buy pretzels, the big Philadelphia pretzels. And I'd buy them for five cents and sell them for eight. But most people would give me a dime and I had a booth set up at five o'clock when the whistle went out and all the workers got off the base, off the arsenal, and they'd buy pretzels from me. Pretzels for a dime. Yeah, good profit margin, <laughs> five cents to 10. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, and I heard years later, we were talking uh, at a family reunion and oh, yeah. uh, Yeah, tell the story about that. So my mom's aunt, or great aunt, worked at the factory. Yeah, 60 years after I was selling pretzels, I found out that a a relative of mom's was remembered going by and buying pretzels from a cute little boy uh, (laughs) selling pretzels at the gate, and that was me. The pretzel boy. (laughs) Pretzel boy, (laughs) and mustard, yeah. And then, uh, so after all that, about high school, you ended up in San Diego. Yeah, that was one of my dad's uh, goals was to have me go to one high school so I could actually have some friends yeah. because we moved so often. It was hard to make long term friends. So, yeah, he retired in San Diego and uh, uh, I went to high school down there at La Jolla High and then went to San Diego State. And what was your first vehicle? So what was your first Ooh. ride? First vehicle was my mom had a Toyota Corolla station wagon. And I ended up putting air shocks on it and lifting it up and putting big tires on it. And they were so embarrassed, they gave it to me. And I had it for three days and traded in for a Dodge Tradesman 100 van and ended up working weekends, painting houses, doing odd jobs, and then building out my own van, which is kind of weird. Yeah, it's pretty ironic, huh? Yeah, 10 year (laughs) reunion, everybody's like, what do you do? I go, you're not gonna believe what I do. Because I was known as a van guy in high school. What was an orange van with like a black stripe, wasn't it? Orange van with a black stripe around it. And I painted the stripe in a driveway with spray cans. And uh, it faded through. And so it looked like Starburst. Everybody thought it was a custom paint job. It was really a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What about uh, any other vehicles you've had over the years that are memorable or awesome? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the vans have been the most memorable. When I met your mom, I was going to San Diego State, had a 59, 356 Porsche, which was fun. I could make that thing run. It had 
easy engine to work on, and then a lot of old Broncos and uh, four-wheel drive Jeeps and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I remember a couple of those Broncos, and uh, also remember a brown Econoline van that we had when we were growing up. Before you got into the van business, we had uh, just a passenger brown Econoline. Well, yeah, three boys, so on the weekends, we'd go out to the river, go out to the desert, and uh, we bought a van, so we'd load that van up on, uh, on Friday night, drive out to the desert, camp Saturday, Sunday, Sunday get home, unload that van and clean it all out. And Monday morning you'd come up and go, dad, dad, let's do that again. I'm like, no, I'm going to work and get some rest <laughs> because it was a lot of driving, a lot of cleaning, but wanted a van for that because we were weekend warriors yeah. and didn't want a trailer because we'd have to pull a trailer out there and I thought I'd have to come back and unhook that and clean it. Motorhome would eat us on gas. So really we've been in the van life business and lifestyle since the 80s. Yep. And you were working in electronics at the time. So when you had me and my brother, uh, Ryan, uh, that was in 1980 and 1982. Right. And so you were working in an electronics company and then had uh, Andrew in 87. Yeah, those are the three we know of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how was that? What was the electronic? What, what were you doing back then before you got into the, the van world? Uh, well, started with a company called IVAC making medical infusion pumps and then got hired by some uh, sales guys that were calling on me. And I was the third employee at a company called Rhino Electronics and we sold components. We were a distributor. So I guess my story is I went from high tech to low tech and now I'm in no tech, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. I like the no tech. Yeah. So we were, you mentioned we were looking for different vehicles to go camping and you had checked out. Volkswagens, trailers, you mentioned motorhomes. I remember looking at the uh, the Lance campers with the uh, the truck bed campers and everything, but having a family of five, none of those really fit the bill totally, right? They really didn't, and the Volkswagen was the closest, but we ended up having boats and towing trailers, and you couldn't tow a Hobie Cat on a windy day with one of those. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we needed something that when we weren't camping, we could also use for three soccer games a day, three little league games. We, we'd leave the house on weekends, you know, at seven in the morning and, and come back at five. So a van was really nice to be able to hang out in and everything. And those other vehicles, you'd have to store them. And it just didn't, didn't fit our lifestyle at all. Yeah, the practicality, it's not just the camping. I do remember growing up, we, we played a lot of sports as kids and uh, yeah, going to the soccer tournaments and baseball tournaments it could be freezing cold outside or hot or whatever and we could go back in the van and we had snacks in the fridge and I remember our friends being pretty jealous of that yeah it's a good place to hang out between games and everything so the Volkswagen is kind of what teed it off and we had that brown van without a top on it and I actually had a mechanical engineer that worked for me in the electronics business uh, Jim now and I said Jim I'd really like one of those Volkswagen tops but on a V8 Ford van and he goes, I can do that. And so we started that project and that's what actually got us involved with Sportsmobile. Uh, because you start a project like that, I looked at every van on the road and I finally saw one in Mission Beach with that top on it. And I go, there's no way that guy paid that much money to get you know, four and a half inches. Although some guys I probably would. <laughs> but anyway, I followed the guy home and I said, hey, where'd you get this? And he goes, oh, it's this little company back in Indiana. I don't even think they're still in business. And I, I kind of started panicking. I get a hold of them. I find so you out Googled that, it? Yeah. There, there was no Google. There was no internet. No. Yeah. Was this like 1988? 88. 87, yeah, 88. It was 88. Yeah. And uh, found out that they had a, an office in Texas and got a hold of them and uh, ended up flying down there to buy one. And so you get to Texas, you're like, these are awesome. There's a huge market out west for these. Uh, why weren't they selling in California? Uh, met with the guy that founded the company, Charles Borski, and uh, actually said that. I said, hey, there's a big market out there. You know, why don't you guys sell these out there? And he's like, well, you know, everybody in California is a little crazy. They want weird colors. They're suing each other. He goes, I don't want to have anything to do with those crazy California people. So uh, we ended up signing a deal with him and uh, we bought, uh, we ordered 20 vans and drop shipped them to Texas to build. And uh, we started doing shows and marketing, which the, none of that was done on the West Coast. And we outsold their capacity, I think in the first six months. 
And they said, whoa, whoa, time out. You got to build them out there. And it was like, no, no, time out. There's a lot that goes into these vans. You build them and I'll sell them. But yeah, we ended up putting a factory up in uh, Fresno and started building them to keep up with the demand. So the showroom you had started in 1989 in San Diego. And right. you had, what, a couple vans? Yeah, I know you ordered 20 vans to, to get built. But usually, what, one, two at a time kind of in the showroom? We'd have two in the showroom. We had only a 2,000 square foot showroom. And yeah. I still had my other job. And mom was working the, uh, the showroom and everything. And didn't really know much about automotive or RVs and stuff. So it was a good learning process. She would yeah. call me up at work if somebody came in and we'd get together. And I remember when it was, what, what's a gray water tank? What is that? I no, thought our no. tanks are black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, no. Well, no, we have both. <laughs> it was a, it was call it, our water tank's gray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was, it was definitely a learning curve, but we got it down. Yeah, and the vehicles sell themselves. I mean, that's what's so great, great about these vans is like people can envision the possibilities of their lifestyle. And I mean, not only are they they cool looking and, and eye catching, but it's uh, kind of putting yourself into that place of when you're going to be using this, how you're going to be enjoying it. And kind of that lifestyle change it can give you. It really does. Like mom said, uh, I moved her cheese because she wasn't really into camping and everything. And and now we, we don't want to stop. Yeah. So you have this new company in California. There's no internet. We don't have social media. You're not blasting pictures on Instagram. What was the, the marketing technique back in the late 80s, early 90s, like how did you get the word out to, to sell all these vans? Well, we did a lot of camping in our other van. So we'd go camping a lot. We'd go down to Mission Bay. We'd go to all the sporting events. And we actually had cheap labor back then. We had three boys and we would actually give them flyers and they would go out. You guys would go out and put them on vans uh, just trying to sell tops. Uh, it was and pop tops on the van. So it was all <laughs> that and doing shows and just being out camping. Yeah, I, I remember we had a stack of flyers in, no matter what car we were in, there was a stack of uh, Sportsmobile pop top flyers. And uh, we'd be going to Carl's Jr. or Taco Bell or something. And you'd be like, hey, look, there's a van in the parking lot. And one of us would grab the flyer, jump out, run in, put it on the, the windshield. And yeah, I remember the, the grassroots oh, marketing yeah. back that's, then. That's how we did it. Yeah. And then doing the shows, I think, uh, was really good. I remember helping uh, helping out doing those at a young age. So started in the shop working. I would pick up screws. I would... Uh, wash vans. Uh, we'd raise hell with some of the employees. I remember uh, Ryan squirting someone with the, the hose right before he was uh, set to go on a date one night. So yeah, uh, yeah we were, uh, I'm sure the, the guys liked all the little kids running around, but uh, we learned the business at a young age and we learned how, uh, you know, how the culture of, of building vans was and, and our customers and working with people and uh, started doing those auto shows. I was probably like 13, 14 and uh, like a rep at the show. And I remember people coming up to me and I was like, hey, can I help you? <laughs> Probably not. I looked like I was 10, you know, I was super young looking. Yeah. And then uh, about 20 minutes later, I remember going up to you and say, hey, how does this kid know so much about these vans? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in them. Yeah, and <laughs> then of course he thought I was bribing people to tell him that. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we, uh, we grew up around the shop. And uh, Well, one of the things about the shop that I remember is that you know, there's always SOB, son of boss. And there's always a concern about that. And uh, I remember our employees, one of our employees came up and they go, Johnny and Ryan are the only the only guys we let play soccer with us. They had uh, that soccer team and oh, yeah. you guys were really good at soccer. And they were pretty choosy on who got to play with them on their, uh, their teams. And they go, yeah, Johnny and Ryan are okay. Yeah. <laughs> And then Andrew, our youngest brother, was really the best, but he was a little younger at the time, but he ended up uh, playing for the U.S. National Beach Soccer Team. Yep. And uh, yeah, so he was the true pro soccer player in the family. That's because you guys would chase him around and take things away from him. He's five years younger, so he wasn't afraid of bigger kids. <laughs> yeah, he had to keep up. And he was fast. He was fast. <laughs> yep, <laughs> definitely. All right, so then we get into um, really four by fours, right? So. We, you had these pop-up camper vans and you thought, let's go off-roading. And well, so how did that yeah. all kind of Well, that was one of the things I had Broncos and stuff and we'd go out to Anza Borrego and you need four-wheel drive out there. And I go, boy, what a combination it would be to have the van with the four-wheel drive. So we got a hold of a company back east called Pathfinder and bought some four-wheel drive chassis from them. 
And I remember the first show that we did, because I was trying to convince mom that, hey, let's do four-wheel drives. And she goes, no, no, we don't want to do four-wheel drives. I go, no, we really do want to do four-wheel drives. And people would come up and uh, they'd go, wow, is that a four-wheel drive van? I really want one. And she would look around and she goes, did, did my husband tell you to come over here and say that? And that's kind of how we got into it, was starting doing shows and, uh, you know, hunting shows and the sport of shows. And, and introducing people Fred to four-wheel Hall drive vans because do back there the weren't day. any out there. I mean, there was not a factory option. Yeah. Yeah, so that is it's pretty unique seeing a lifted 4x4 van. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you have all the amenities of home in this off-road vehicle, I mean, it just makes a ton of sense. Oh, it does. And it, I mean, they're just the ultimate vehicle for what we did and how we camped. And so Pathfinder was kind of a small company and they, they kind of faded away, right? And yeah. then... Uh, there was a bigger company back in Pennsylvania that had a lot of experience doing four by four vans called Quigley Motor Company. Yes. And so we got a hold of Quigley and I mean, what you ended up becoming their biggest customer within a matter of number one dealer, right? Yeah, yeah. number one dealer. Yeah, in a couple of years. How many a year do you Quigley vans, four bys? Do you back think you were then doing? it was probably a hundred, hundred plus vans a year vans. through them. And that's yeah. like yeah, early to late nineties. Early, yeah, mid nineties. Mid nineties, yeah, that's probably the peak of doing all those Quigley vans. Right. And then I remember we'd be doing the shows and people would say, Hey, these are great, but have you ever thought doing of doing something a little more gnarly, like a hardcore four wheel drive? Yeah, and actually how that came about, we were looking for an engineer for our electric pop tops and interviewed this guy here in Clovis, Fred Wharf. And on the third interview, I'm like, Hey Fred, you know, you're the guy we want to hire you. And he's like, Whoa, time out. He goes, I haven't told you the best part. And I go, what's that? And he goes, four-wheel drive. He goes, that's my passion. I like designing four-wheel drive suspension and drive lines and stuff. And I said, well, you know, we are dealing with Quigley Motors. We're their number one dealer. It's really not a big market out there for this. And uh, there's already a couple guys doing it and don't like copying people, don't want to be a me too. Yeah. And uh, then I screwed up and said, so we're really not interested unless it's different. And he designed this four-wheel drive system with all California components. Our axles are made by Dynatrack down in Huntington Beach. Our transfer cases are made in Paso Robos by Advanced Adapters. Springs are made here in Fresno by Betts. Uh, sway bars made in Visalia by Hellwig. You know, shocks are made by Fox down San in Diego. Santee. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, people say nothing's made in California. Every one of those components is made in California, then it's assembled in California. It is and pretty cool. It's all the best stuff. And, and I remember Fred telling me, and, and I'm not much of a gearhead. I mean, I've gotten more into it as I've been in the business, of course. But growing up, we were more into sports than uh, building cars. So when Fred's telling me, I got a Dynatrack axle and I got an Atlas transfer case. I knew Fox shocks, but all the components, I'm like, hey, sounds great, Fred. And, you know, it's, it's going to be cool, I guess. Well, the first time I drove one of these things, I was at the gas station. And a guy, I saw he had a Jeep on a trailer. The thing wasn't even street legal. You know, it had all the rock crawling uh, set up on it. And uh, I'm filling up and then I'm about to drive away and I hear a guy yelling. I look and I see his legs sticking out from under the van. I almost ran him over. Yeah. And he was under there looking at the components. He jumps out. He's like, holy shit, man. You got a Dynatrack axle. You got an Atlas transfer. You got... He's naming all. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, man, I got that same stuff on my Jeep. Yeah. I can't believe you have it on a van. And I'm like, well, this, this isn't really a van. This is a motorhome. And he's like, get out of here. So I open up the ends and he's like, dude, this is, mind if I take some pictures? And so that's, uh, you kind of get used to that going to the gas stations though, right? Well, it's, almost couldn't get out of anywhere without explaining to people what it yeah. was and everything. But yeah, all the best components, but driving it, it was at a tighter turning radius. It had more articulation. It was just, it was night and day pretty much off road. Yeah, with the disconnecting sway bars, uh, that was one of the unique features of our 4x4 system. And I remember the first photo shoot that Fred took. I mean, they had that thing. We were in Moab and we had the axles. We had a cross axle picture. It was it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty intense for a, like I said, for a motorhome. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty extreme. Yeah, we'd be back in, you know, Coyote Canyon, Sheep Canyon and Moab. And people are like, how did you get that back here? <laughs> yeah. It was pretty, pretty fun. So going along with that, you know, I imagine having an off-road vehicle and having this capability, but it weighs a lot. And people probably needed to learn a little bit about how to use these things off-road. That's how we started our rallies. Our first rally was, I believe, in 99? 98, I think. 98. Yeah. 
Yeah, in Lake Isabella. Lake Isabella, yeah. And we started that because a lot of our customers have had Land Rovers or Jeeps or four-wheel drive pickup trucks. But yeah, like you said, with uh, 10,000 pounds, it's a little bit different. And it's your number one asset. I mean, it's your ride home, it's your kitchen, it's where you're sleeping. Yeah. You know, when I used to teach that, I was telling people, number one thing, preserve the asset. Do not go where it's not going to come back because it's expensive. It's going to be expensive. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, doing those rallies was uh, educational, really. That's how it started, and then it turned into a big social. Uh, yeah, I function. actually have some uh, yeah. showing on the, the screen here. We got an invitation. This one was uh, actually for a 2007 <coughs> rally where we did an Olympic challenge. Um, we uh, had little pins made up for all the different uh, rallies. It's fun. People still have all these, the original pins. and um, So I was... Uh, one of the leaders at, at a rally and uh in fact i got my my plaque here we did an olympic challenge back in 2007 and uh i actually wasn't supposed to be the instructor we had some uh, that's right experts yeah. from warren winch coming out for that one and he got the flu or something couldn't two fly. days before yeah. and couldn't come out and so i got tagged to do the winching demo I was like, yeah that shouldn't be a problem i'm pretty familiar with the the product the kicker was he had this set up to where the scenario was you have your van here, you've got a tree in front of you, so you can't go forward, you're stuck in some mud, you need to go backwards, but we only have a winch on the front of the van. Okay, so he draws this diagram and with these snatch blocks, which basically these pulley systems. So we have a pulley set up to the, the tree in front of us, and then another pulley off to another point, we parked another van here, Right. And we had another van behind with a pulley on it to a pulley on the van that's stuck. In the back. Ba yeah, in the back, in the hitch, back to the van in the back. And that's where we hooked on. Right. So it went pulley, pulley, around, pulley, back to the original van off a of pulley, and then back to the van behind it. And I'm thinking, you're just going to rip this van in half. You know, I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, dude, are you messing with me right now? I'm like, there's no way. But uh, yeah, I learned, yeah, I wasn't much, much of a, a scientist, right? And I learned, uh, or engineer, learned about a mechanical advantage. And so since we had that double pulley in the back, as we were going forward, we were actually moving backwards twice as fast, essentially. Yeah. And so it, it was such an amazing thing to see. But uh, as we were uh, going through the drill, uh, it was really a good exercise because you had all these people uh, working as a team. It was the Olympic challenge too. So we had all these different events and uh, you had a lot of equipment to set up. So you had, you know, four different snatch blocks and you had all the different points and making sure everyone was staying safe. And so it really was a good exercise. And then, yeah, when, when you get it all hooked up and watching those people push that button and seeing that cable go forward and then the van going backwards. Uh, yeah, that, was that was pretty neat. That was pretty so, cool. So yeah, every one of those rallies, we had a theme. And so that was the Olympic challenge because it was in it was in Camas, Utah, where the Olympics were at Salt Lake. Salt so Lake, yeah. that was the theme there. And then we had, uh, you know, themes for uh, in Colorado for gold mining. And we yep. had uh, Baja, we had a rally in Baja. And we took uh, 86 of these down to Mexico. That, yeah. was, that was a little bit of a challenge. So, so yeah, yeah some fun. of the stories from these rallies. So we had, I remember the first one, uh, the guy pulls in, just gets there, immediately gets stuck. Uh, he had an extended length van and he went to drive through this ditch and he got down okay. And then on the way up, the trailer hitch got caught on the back and his back wheels were just spinning. Yeah. Um, so we got to do our first winching demo at uh, that rally. <laughs> on the way in, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he, uh, he helped us with that. He was a great subject vehicle. And then um, that same rally, we had a customer, Gordon. Gordon Othier, yes. Yeah. And Gordon was <laughs> a bit of a Gordon. wild man. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember he was designing his van, and his grandson, I think he was like nine years old at the time, uh, he let him design the paint job. Yeah, and it was wild. like, it looked like shark fins with ribbons coming off of them and flames. Green. And, all, and yeah. yeah. And I'm like, you're really getting, sure enough, he, he painted the van like that. And uh, it kind of fit his his attitude. Yeah, <laughs> his image. So we had, Quigley was out there. There was a big grassy hill. And uh, Gordon said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive my van up that hill. And Quigley's like, this is great. You know, we're going to see what these things can really do. Um, but yeah, it was wet and pretty steep. And so he gets to the bottom of this thing. He gets about halfway up and wheels are spinning and back down. And 
about halfway up again, wheels are spinning back down. And then I remember Mike Quigley, the president of Quigley at the time goes down there and let's, let's throw this thing in low range and let's get you in a lower gear and then let's get a running start. And so Gordon scoots back on this hill and he charges it. And this thing is, is going up the hill. And then at the top, there was just kind of like a, it was like a little a crest, yeah. Yeah, a little berm. And uh, he didn't slow down for that. He no. just, I mean, he caught air coming yeah. off of this thing. <laughs> and everyone's there was like, oh my God, you know, and slams down the front end, jumps out. You know, I'm expecting wheels to start flying off this 10,000 pound rig, you know, come through the air. And it comes to rest and he jumps out of that thing, climbs on top of the van, stands on his roof rack, roof rack and let's do it again. Yeah. And he Gordon's, did. Yeah, Gordon and was he, crazy boy. Sure enough, he drives right back down there and jumps his van again. And I'm like, all right, that's enough. We're going to break in yeah. here. But yeah, that was pretty wild. And then uh, Baja, uh, that was interesting. Yeah, that we had a lot of newbies down there. And uh, going into Mexico was a little different for them. We had people from Chicago, Seattle, never been down there. So as we're crossing the borders, you could actually see them grip the steering wheel different and get a little white knuckled. And we're on the highway but yeah we took we went back in the canyons and everything and one of the nice things for us about those rallies was the pre-runs oh, yeah. so we would go down and pre-run multiple times before we took 80 and it ended up all the other rallies were 100 vans or 100 plus in colorado and utah and california and so we'd pre-run and we'd have a really good time we they ended up we had a rally committee that would go because we'd set all this stuff up with the catering and everything. And uh, they, the pre-runs ended up being the should have been their rallies because we had, for us, a lot of fun on that because we didn't have to work it. And like going to Mexico, we went down with Norm Roberts who'd written five books on Baja and Dick Swankmeyer who was a professor out of San Diego State. And, uh, and who was Norm College. married to? Norm was married to the ex first lady of Mexico. So we had some connections <laughs> down there too. Yeah. And the Elicios had a big ranch down in Ducati where we ended the rally. Yeah. And then two Baja Bobs, but a lot of experienced people. And we'd go down there and we'd learn a lot of stuff yeah. ourselves before we took a hundred vehicles down there. So it was interesting and fun. Met a lot of good people. Yeah, what was there like four or five vans on the committee on the pre-run? Yeah, five, probably around five to five six vans. vans. Yes, and that's a good group to travel in. Yeah, one to six is a good group down yeah. in Mexico. Eighty-six, right. we had to break up into groups of ten and had leaders and well, that's tails a lot of work. And that's yeah. the thing: the rallies are a lot of work. They're not as much fun for the people hosting them as they are the attendees, probably. Oh so. yeah, that's why we we enjoyed the pre-runs. Yeah, and now we're having should have been their rallies. And uh, it's funny you mentioned the pre-run because I, I brought a picture from one of the pre-runs and you got to become real good friends with a lot of these customers and oh, owners yeah. of the vans and still, still keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. still travel with some. And uh, so one uh, guy who was really a lot of fun took this picture. Oh, no, we're not doing that picture. <laughs> that, that picture is going away. So <laughs> this was uh, the pre-run down in Baja, right? And it was a little bit windy. And you were wearing shorts under that, right? Yeah, 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 I was. <laughs> so the wind blew the sombrero. And uh, so at the, I think it was at the Baja rally, he had that because I was taken during, it was at Colorado. Oh, okay, yeah. so I was taken at the Baja later. rally. And then a year later, uh, we're doing awards at the Colorado rally. And uh, Craig Peterson had this bad boy out. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a surprise. Yeah, yeah. That, I thought that picture got thrown away years ago. <laughs> it's been my office. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, uh, you got the best of Craig, though, after that, right? Well, yeah, that picture was taken down. There was Wendy, and his wife wanted to take a picture, and she had that big sombrero. It was kind of a joke. She goes, hold this. Well, I wanted to take a picture, too, so I, the wind was blowing so hard, I just let my body hold it. And then Craig or somebody took a picture and then blew it up and everything. But I don't think he'll ever do that again. Yeah, so we were at the LA Auto Show and uh, a lady came up and said, hey, one of my friends owns this van and uh, it was Craig Peterson. Well, and, yeah, his... Well, so, it was his... She worked with him, right? Yeah, she was yeah. his office mate. His office and, mate. And I go, I didn't think Craig had any friends. And she's like, oh yeah, well, yeah, I'm kind of... I work with him, I'm at my desk butt up against each other. I go, you are my new best friend. Because I had one of our other customers who was a professional photographer, George Lepp, 
take a picture of Craig and Janine at the rally in Moab. And he'd actually taken Craig's head and put it on my body. And then took Janine's head and put it on my body. And for Craig, he took that big sombrero and shrank it down to about this size. <laughs> and Janine had a couple sombreros on. But I had it made into a slide. And Craig was a professor at Mount Sac, and he taught environmental biology. So every year, he'd go on these trips with these students. And at the end of the year, they'd have this big thing in the auditorium, a thousand students and everything, and he would do a slideshow. And I'm like, how can I get that slide in his slideshow as payback? And when she came up at the auto show, I said, you are my new best friends. And I told her what the deal was. And she goes, I'll do it. And so back then, PowerPoint was just coming about. And she goes to Craig, she goes, hey, the slides are kind of out. I want to do a PowerPoint. I'll do the whole thing. And he's doing this presentation, thousand students, faculty and everything. And he's talking about it. And then the last slide comes up and it's him with the little sombrero. <laughs> and he's facing the audience. And this is a guy that's been a professor for 30 years, no lack of words. And he goes, Alan, he's a talker. He goes, everybody's laughing. People are rolling in the aisles. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And he turned around and he goes, I saw that. And I'm like, my two worlds just collided. He goes, I have my academic world and I have my van world. And they just went. And he goes, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. That was I one of my ultimate paybacks. <laughs> the surprise is on his face. Just turn around yeah. seeing that up there. Yeah, yeah. Well, we still travel with them. They're great people. They've been on the rally. They were on, went to all 10 rallies or 11 rallies. And it was it was good. They're on their second van, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Second van. So on that on the Baja rally, uh, we mentioned being prepared and people from all over. So, I mean, it was a small checklist. It was like, fill your water tank, make sure you have gas, but make sure you mail your taxes before you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was in yeah. April. Yeah, there was one guy, we'd get down there. He's like, hey, I need to mail this off. I got my, my taxes down well, in what Mexico. What happened was he was on his way down. We told people, full of water, full of, of gas, have all your medications in the bottles, don't put them in a baggie, <laughs> yeah. and no firearms. Yeah. And so we, on the way in, and we had extra gas, we had a whole support team and extra fuel and mechanics and all that stuff in case of breakdowns, because we were out in Laguna Salada in the middle of nowhere. And uh, he breaks down going in, and we get, Saul was one of our, one of yeah. our guys was on the team, and we go in to drop the fuel tank, and it was real easy to drop because there was no gas in it. And we're like, he ran out of gas. And uh, so we filled up his tanks and everything. And that fuel was for coming out in case people ran out. So we sent our pit crew into uh, Mexicali to fill up with fuel. And we went and we took all the other fuel and we're going around to all the other vehicles that had smaller tanks, dumping the fuel in. So we'd have all empty cans going in mm -hmm. and have more fuel. And he goes, well, if your guys are going into Takati, can they just go across the border and uh and mail my tax return and it was like no no <laughs> one it's saturday and two the tax returns aren't due till monday so but i mean yeah we had i'm going to write a book since i'm imagine. retired now i'm going to keep people's names out of it but, <laughs> yeah we have uh you know 30 years of storage stories yeah yeah there was some good ones at those rallies the uh yeah running out of gas and because our guys knew it's like it's not getting fuel you know, it must be the sending unit. And so, yeah, drop this fuel tank. And it's like, well, we know why it's not getting fuel. It's because you're out of gas, dude. I mean, what in the... Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, you're, you can get a little frustrated when you're dealing with stuff like that. And then I remember later in that rally, we cooked a barbecue, a great dinner. And it was like steak and salad. And we had... It was fully catered. And, and we did it all. And we were walking by and some lady says, uh, what's your vegetarian option? <laughs> so you I, had a... I had one. You had a fork in your hand and grabbed your steak, put it on your plate and said, that's the vegetarian option right there. Yep. <laughs> and, went, went full vegan. <laughs> and then we had uh, the Sportsmobile Olympics. You touched on that. Um, so that was where we teamed. Wait, it was like five vans per team. We might have had 15 different teams, maybe six, eight vans per team, because we had about 100, 100 vans there in these rallies. Vans at those. And uh, in the prize was, uh, it's funny, we made the BF Goodrich tires in the shape of the uh, Olympic of the rings. Olympic rings, and so you got a brand new set of BFG all terrains for the everyone on the winning team. So yeah. each van got a brand new set, and so that was a pretty big prize. And then there was some good runner-up prizes as well. And so the competition level 
uh, was really raised. I mean, people are competitive anyway, and uh, but having that uh, that nice prize really really got people going. And we had different contests like uh, the slow drags. Um, so it was how slow you could drive over a obstacle without stopping. Because yeah, in four buying, you know, speed isn't necessarily your friend. A lot of times you want to have that technique and be able to drive slow. But we had yeah slow drags. We had how to break into a van fastest. Uh, tire changing competition. We had a winching competition. Right. I think the favorite one though was the uh, the water balloon test. Well, that was a slow drag. Okay, so that was that a slow was drag. Slow. That's right. We, we put that chair on the front of That's the right. vehicle with a balloon above it with nail spikes out of. See how there was a hitch in the front of the van, and uh, we took one of our old seats and mounted it to this contraption, slid in the hitch, and then it had like this halo over the top. Right. And it had spikes coming through the halo, and then it had a water balloon hanging there. And so, if you weren't careful and you jerked that van around, that balloon would swing into the spikes, and uh, there's a person sitting in the whoever chair. was sitting in that chair uh, would get soaked. So it was fun getting the husband wife combo, right? So oh, I remember Carolyn someone... Valley. <laughs> Joe was sitting up there, and she punched it right away, and she goes, "I just wanted to get it over with." <laughs> That yeah. was great, yeah. But uh, yeah, so you'd see, we would see how far they could get their van before that balloon popped yep. and soaked their uh, Yeah, their and then partner. the person sitting in the, the driver had to go sit in a seat and rotate drivers. So. Oh, yeah, and it was whoever made got wet. This, Yeah, A lot of people got wet. And then uh, the biggest hit, I think, of all the contests was the uh, rubber ducky races. Rubber ducky races were good. <laughs> the... Uh, the competition for the best tailgate was good. Oh, the tailgate competition. That was, yeah. that was epic. <laughs> you can actually find that on YouTube, the tailgate competition. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the film crew was out there doing it. And uh, it's a good thing they had that because I don't think most of us remembered really the end of it. Most so, of the judges don't remember. And you were one of the judges. It was yeah. the judges, yeah. So the, the theme of this uh, event was you have a big client coming into your town. Your boss calls you, right? And you have a big client coming in. And he knows that you have the most badass van around and he ne needs you to host a tailgate for this big client. And so really we just tricked everyone into throwing us a big party. So we had 15 or so vans set up. Everyone picked one van out of their group and used it to set up the ultimate tailgate. And uh, you know, there was some nice tequila, whiskey, beers, I mean, we had back rubs, but basically uh -huh. it was the, the judge's job to go around and sample each tailgate. And uh, you can imagine how that went. Yeah. Uh, Some of the judges didn't make it to all the vans. They, they got, there was a lot of bribery going on, a lot of tequila. Yeah, we had, you had score sheets, and you kind of went along and uh, scored. Well, you were supposed to score as you go, because if you didn't, you were going to end up like Eber and Jim McGean from Dynatrack. I remember at the end of it, I just saw the two of them standing in the kind of swaying in the middle of the field with their sheets, trying to remember what tailgate, yeah. <laughs> trying to grade them. But uh so there was that, and then the rubber ducky races, we talked about Craig, uh, who played the joke with the uh, uh, sombrero photo. He, uh, he's never short with words, and uh, so he actually had a, a little speaker. Yeah, that he used to use in school when he would do the uh, outdoor. It was like a portable uh, PA. He like, yeah. was like wore it around his neck and then had a little microphone, and he was walking around, and he was announcing these rubber ducky races. And <laughs> so everyone decorated their ducks and again the the competition level was crazy how how nuts people were going trying to win this thing well people were betting on ducks yeah <laughs> it was a buck a duck and it was a bet and then i think we donated to the sbca there that's right yeah yeah there was definitely a lot of side bets going on yeah. but the the idea was everyone put the ducks in the stream and then as they go if a duck would get hung up you couldn't release that duck until the last duck had passed it. Right. And then you could release it. So you could be way out in the lead. The guys are thinking, oh, we've got this in the bag. And then all of a sudden, duck would get hung up on a, on a rock. And they're, I mean, go, go. It was like watching the Kentucky Derby. I mean, I've never seen people get so excited. <laughs> These rubber ducky races. Well, the guy that won that was a software engineer from Silicon Valley with uh, not a very good personality and my member mom went up and goes you won you won he goes that was the stupidest thing i've ever done in my life and i had the most fun doing it <laughs> <laughs> i've never had such but a good I, time but i remember mike quick it was either mike quidley or or crazy gordon was throwing rocks at the other ducks you know oh, yeah. to stop them it was competitive yeah. yeah 
And then Craig's on his PA, and I mean, he's taking the seeds. Like, I remember him saying, "What? This is no cheese ball operation here, people. This is rubber ducky where we got to get this stuff together." No, oh. <laughs> he was going he off was, on that. He was. Yeah, yeah, rallies, rallies were fun. They yeah. were, they were really a good time, and a lot of those people met each other and still travel together. Yeah, and then there even the, a band formed. So it was the, <laughs> the first well, rally, right? Yeah. Tell well, that the story. The first rally, we had a guy sitting in the uh, showroom before, like weeks before the rally, and he's waiting for uh, something to be done on his van. He's playing a guitar, and I'm like, "Wow, that guy is really good." And I said, "Hey, we're having this rally. You want to, you know, do be the entertainment for the night around the campfire and stuff?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, sure, I'll do it." Well, rally comes, he doesn't show up, and so we were we were left hanging. And later I found out he didn't show up because he was John Lennon's funeral. He was that good. Of, I, didn't, I didn't know who oh, he was. Geez. And so he was a good player. But then a group of our uh, customers just got together and they started a band. And they got one guy had a mandolin. A couple of people had a guitar. Janine had a harmonica. And I mean, oh, yeah. these people have talent. I mean, they just sat down together and started playing. Yeah, never met each other. No, and yeah. we don't have any musical talent. So I get, yeah. it just blows <laughs> our mind. But you just see these people get up and all of a sudden they're full-on jam session and then i mean they even came out with a cd oh yeah yeah ted wrote some original songs mike quigley stuck in the mud and pop my top and yeah. the pop top blues and but they ended up being a, a real band after that just for the events and i remember one lady her husband went out and bought a electronic drum set that could run off the inverter and uh going to mexico uh, for the rally down there because there's no power or anything so she, he got this electronic drum set and she came up to me and she goes hey do you think ted because ted got a little picky who wanted to be in the well, band he was legit yeah all the musicians yeah, well, were really good yeah. i mean it wasn't so he yeah. didn't want guys you know just bringing their bongos or their tin pans <laughs> out and stuff like that he was serious about it and she goes uh do you think uh you know they let frank in the band as a drummer because you don't have a drummer and i go well I'll, I'll ask ted and everything i go is frank good and she goes well i he was the backup drummer for like blood, sweat, and tears and stuff. <laughs> yeah, he was good. Yeah, and, and they went off. Accepted. And, yeah, yeah, good, legit deal. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. So, what else you got from the rallies? We had oh, so Mike Quigley stuck in the mud. That was at Hollister. That was at Hollister. So we did some of the events. I mean, they really started out as educational, how to drive the van, how to fix the van. We had all these worst case scenarios. So, like you mentioned at the uh, Olympic challenge the uh the tailgate that was after a full day i mean we ran these through people through gps courses and changing tires fixing flats uh doing all kinds of stuff they, they were pretty beat and we had a five o'clock uh a meeting and we said okay we got one more uh, challenge for the day it's the worst case scenario your boss comes into town and these people ran to their vans. And I remember Jim McGean came over and he goes, did somebody get hurt? What happened? And I go, no, this is the challenge. And then afterwards on the way home, a van passed us at one of the gas stations and we hear on the CB, I can't believe you guys made us throw a party for you <laughs> <laughs> after that long day, but yeah. it was fun. But yeah, it's it mainly challenges. And it started in Mexico because we went down there with Norm Roberts and it was this little slot canyon that it, Indians from Utah came down like 500 years ago because they were getting chased down the Colorado River by another tribe or something. And there was petroglyphs and grinding holes and we're going up this canyon and there were just six of us doing it. And it was like, this is really cool. But when we have a 200 people doing this, it's going to be like Disneyland. So it's like, what can we do to keep people in camp and, and make it interesting? So we came up with this uh, scavenger hunt. And we had like uh, dragonfly, right? Because when I mean, we had people from Chicago, Midwest coming, everybody's got, somebody's gonna have a dragonfly in their grill, right? And then we came up with uh, Spanish fly, right? Well, we're in Mexico, so every fly is Spanish. Well, for dragonfly, we had one guy tie a string around his Spanish fly and drag it through the desert. We had a lot of creative people, <laughs> yeah. a lot of intelligent people. And there was a lot of com competition going on on that and interesting stuff with snatch blocks and winching accessories and everything that we put in there and those pins and t-shirts. That's oh, yeah. why people would keep those because we'd say, okay, which team has the, the oldest t-shirt or the most t-shirts from the most rallies. And so it, it got it to be fun. competitive and fun. Yeah. And then, so rallies, we said were a lot of work and, but it was something that was necessary and the community really needed it. 
And then I think that got recognized by, you know, Overland Journal. Um, well, our and, last rally in Camas, Utah, Scott Brady and his wife were there and they were just starting the Overland Journal. And they were there signing people up, giving the magazine out. It was the first, the first time they were doing it. And Scott came up to me afterwards and he goes, wow, this is really cool. I go, well, nobody's doing it. Nobody's training these people. I mean, we had medical training. We had all this Overland stuff because there wasn't Overland. I don't even know if that was a word yeah. back when we started doing this. And Scott goes, this is really cool. Do you think we could take this over? And I'm like, please do. Because our insurance company did not like us training people you know, we had, you know, insurance for manufacturing in a dealership. But when we were taking people over Imogene Pass and, you know, in, the, in Colorado on Cinnamon Pass and Engineer Pass. And Moab Trails. Moab. Oh, yeah. uh, our insurance company was, was, was no joke. a little squirm, squirmy about it. So they, they came up with Overland Training mm -hmm. and then they came up with the, uh, the Overland Expo. Because we would have a lot of our suppliers, Jim McGee from Dynatrack, George from Extreme Outback, Warren Winch would be there doing demos. We'd have all this stuff hands on because these people weren't getting training. Nobody else was offering it. Yeah, and it really does cross over into the, the world of overlanding. And overlanding essentially is vehicle based camping and travel and adventuring, right? I mean, that's yeah. kind of the definition. We always used to just call it camping. Yeah. But now, yeah, overlanding is the official term. And uh, so it carries over like the winching demos to the Jeep crowds and, right. to, you know, the guys in the Broncos and the FJs and the Tacomas and truck bed campers. And so it really did make sense for the broader market outside of just the van people. Well, I remember one time Scott Brady was interviewing me and he goes, what is the ultimate overland vehicle? And I go, well, on the record, it's our van off the record it's whatever you got you know to get you out there i mean it can be a good pair of hiking boots it can be a, a bicycle dual sport a moto. motorcycle yep. you know and now there's million dollar earth roamers and stuff like that so the community just blew up yep. and it's good because everybody that went to our rally owned one of our vans mm -hmm. but now at the overland expo i mean it's everything from hiking to the million dollar overland vehicles yeah it is crazy it's uh yeah you get the adventure bikers i think we figured out at the overland expos too the smaller your ride the harder you party yeah that's <laughs> true too the moto guys are nuts i mean i yeah. think it's because you know they're they're sleeping in adrenaline like, junkies yeah. well, and they're sleeping in like cots i mean you got to get pretty hammered to to go to bed comfortably in, in some of their <laughs> setups and then the guys in like the earth roamers and the big class a's you know they're in bed with their glass of wine at like 8 30 you know yeah. well, jeep that's... guys and the van guys were kind of somewhere in between yeah but uh that's true. that's true but it is neat seeing all the different ways that that people travel and all the different products that that get developed and a lot of that does you know someone could come up with something for a jeep or a bronco but that could carry over into the van world so a lot of neat products and, and neat people we've been able to meet at these well, expos. Well, remember the first Overland Expo, I think it was in Prescott, Prescott. Arizona. Yep. There might have been 20 vendors. Yeah. And yeah, now, we were the only van people. Yeah. Now yeah. there's thousands. Well, the van, yeah. when, when mom and I started, we had less than 12 competitors, 12 people making. Now, the last time I tried to count, I think I, I was at 187. Yeah, I think there's over 300 van builders now. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, the whole industry has really gone crazy. And it ties in with, you know, tiny homes have gotten popular, yes. overlanding's grown. I think it also ties into, you know, a lot of social media and uh, camping's gotten popular. People want to take pictures outside and show off some of their travel destinations and, well, and do you, that through the social media. You might not media. remember this, but one of the, the most fitting things that you said to your mom when you had kids was I want to raise our kids like you raised us and that was good because we raised you outside yeah and uh, that's uh, real important I, I think and our yeah our kids love camping in the vans I mean, it's it's well, hard have, to get them out of there you have two girls and they're riding dirt bikes with training wheels on them yeah. and quads in the desert I know I always thought I'd have boys you know <laughs> growing up in a family of you know with three or two brothers the three boys um, it was kind of a shock that I had two girls, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's no different. We're out there playing soccer. We're camping. They, uh, they get so dirty <laughs> playing That's in the great. dirt and yeah, that is, it's what really makes it fun. Yeah. So let's talk about current times. So we've got uh, factory here in Fresno now. Well, 
now we're field man. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, uh, our contract expired with Sportsmobile, and uh, rather than renew the contract, we decided that it was well past time to go off on our own. Yeah, yeah. We, there were some differences. The owner had died. Charles had passed away, yeah. and rest in peace, Charles. Handed to come this this company down to his son, and there were there were some differences, and we were. A little bit more innovative, I'd say, uh, with the four-wheel drive, the electric roof. Our our customer base was different. Uh, we wanted to do different types of marketing and advertising. We just kind of grew apart, and our philosophy was a little different at that point. So it was it was good timing. Yep, yeah, it was timing. We could do a whole podcast on that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah, I think it's been a great success. Uh, you know, going to Field Van. Uh, we have such a loyal customer base that, um, you know, people have really been uh, standing behind us and we've gotten a lot of support from our vendors, our past owners, um, you know, people in the industry. And, uh, you know, like you said, I think a lot of it has to do with the innovation, uh, doing all the shows, doing the rallies. You know, we really kind of elevated that company to the next level. Yeah, we spent 30 years building that brand and you and uh, Andrew are, are continuing the same tradition just yeah. with a new brand. But you kept all the same people and you know yeah. the same philosophies and things like that. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, we have a team 80 members strong now here at Field Van. And one of the biggest things that sets us apart, you were talking about innovation, is the classic. Um, so back in 2014 was the last year that Ford built the Econoline van, and that's always been our staple. I mean, what, what vans are you driving now? I have two Econolines. <laughs> 2010 and a 14? No, a 10 and an 8. Oh, 2008 and, and a 2010. Eight, that's yeah. right. Yeah, the last year of the diesel was 2010. So yeah, your, yeah. your new van is a 2010. Yes, and I, <laughs> I love that van. I've had people offer me crazy money for that van, but I can't replace it. Yeah. Really, because of the diesel. And I, I know. just, I'm... Uh, I mean, I know you don't like diesels, but we go to Mexico and Baja and stuff. And I mean, we filled that van with diesel out of 50 gallon drums before down in Gonzaga Bay and things like that. And, you know, the, the places we go camping, I just it gives me a better range and yep. torque. And I just I'm just a big diesel fan. On your big line is always when you tell people you better have a big plot because you're going to have to bury me in that van. Oh, yeah, I'm taking it with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to buy a double wide plot because it's so big. Yeah, and so but that's that, one of the things about traveling and, and uh, uh, going to different places. I mean, down in Mexico and Baja, it's pretty special. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and watch the sunrise over the Sea of Cortez, and that night watch the sunset over the Pacific. You know, down yeah, in Scorpion not many Bay, in the world you can do that. Yeah, that it is just yeah. it's magical down there. It's a twelve hundred mile peninsula, five different eco zones, I think, and and really cool but then there's other places like uh, uh, Utah is probably my favorite state to go camping and I think they have more BLM land available than every other state other than Alaska and Texas mm -hmm. and you just pull off in so many places and that state I mean they got great national parks but outside and around the parks yeah. great areas Canyon and you lands, just pull off yeah, and camp yeah and so some of the epic spots are you know in colorado uh, again imogene and engineer pass and they call the alpine loop area is real pretty but uh and arizona's got some pretty places and then valley of the gods is another there's a point in the valley of the gods where you're overlooking monument valley where we camp and you actually get to watch the sunrise over the monuments where it starts at the top of the monument and goes down and then that evening you get to watch the sunset where it starts at the you know bottom and goes up. It's it is pretty epic. Yeah, so there's some there's some really there. great camp spots in the United States. And that's what makes the field van unique is having that off road capability, being able to take the comfort of your home to these crazy out of the way places that most RVs and or even two wheel drive uh, vans and campers wouldn't get to. You would need our four by four system with our heavy duty van. And so we were talking about driving innovation and we never, we didn't always see eye to eye on all the new projects most of the time, right? I and mean, we definitely won the electric top. And but I remember you bringing in a crazy product. Uh, so you had the, the vision of a Mitsubishi Fuso. So this thing is an all continent four by four dump truck, basically cab over truck. A utility truck. For sure. Yeah. Utility truck. Looks like a dump truck without the, the dumper. And, uh, 
you saw a trailer that had like a cool pop-up. Well, and actually how that started was I went to Scott Brady, Overland Journal, Graham Jackson, who taught the Overland training, I think five or six guys. And I said, guys, if you can write down 10 things, what would be the ultimate Overland vehicle? Because they did not like our Ford vans for international travel sure. because you couldn't get them serviced. I go, so write me a list. And I took six, eight guys lists. And one of them was it had to be an international chassis. So that's why I picked the Fuso, Fuso because right? it's international. It had to be self-contained. It had to have a shower for hygiene and everything. Cause they're talking about traveling yeah, around the it. world. Yeah. Uh, it had to be, have a pass through between the cab and the camper for security purposes to get to the cab if something's going sideways on you. Uh, so yeah, so you didn't have to get out of the vehicle yeah, so there to be able to get in the driver's list of seat. Things, yeah. And that's why we picked that chassis and is basically put a van on van camper, one of our campers on that chassis with the pop up. And that's how we started that project. And then we got involved with uh, All Train Warriors out of Australia. Yep, All Train Warriors, they've been building on the Fuso and Isuzu chassis for many, many years over in Australia. Yeah. Um, pretty cool. So they saw us at Overland Expo when you had your first kind of prototype. And well, what, uh, what happened on that was we I started that project, okay? And then one of, uh, one of the Overland guys, uh, Hanson, went over to Australia and was consulting with them. They actually started as a tour bus Right. for like Fraser Island and stuff with mm -hmm. the Fuzos and mining was a big uh, transport. They put uh, uh, shells on it for like a bus for mining industry in and out. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to get in the camper business and then they wanted to get into North America. And their consultant goes, oh, if you want to be four wheel drive in North America, you got to get together with these guys, Sportsmobile West. And so they decided they were, they were building this and they had it really nice cab built and, and passed through and they had it all done. And then right before the Overland Expo, we let a little uh, blurb out on ours and they saw it and freaked out and flew over here and met with us at the Expo going, hey, we had this you know deal with you. And it was like, well, nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in their minds, it was like, hey, they're doing this deal, but uh, you know, nobody ever told us. And then that's how we got together. And they were way ahead of us on that and had a way better body. And oh, yeah. So they saw our prototype, solution. which was pretty cool. And, yeah. you know, I, I was always a little leery about the project. And then after linking up with them and see, it turned out to be awesome. And yeah, these are some vehicle. amazing, yeah, internationally type travel vans, but they're still just not quite as awesome as the van. They're not as comfortable, uh, better for international, but then Mitsubishi made the decision not to import their four-wheel drives into the yeah. U.S. anymore. It had small motors. Diesel. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Were, it was, there it, were some it, downsides for this market. They weren't perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, the, like the vans. And so the, the perfect van, of course, for you is the Econoline. In 2014, they discontinued the Econoline van. Yes. And they still offer, and one of the reasons they stopped doing the diesel years ago is because U-Haul didn't want diesels. Right. And U-Haul is the number one customer of the Econoline platform in the United States, probably worldwide. So they really, Ford wanted to cater to U-Haul, their number one customer, and, and U-Haul wanted gas motors, and they wanted these cutaway chassis so they could continue putting their boxes on the back. So Ford continued with these cutaway chassis, and we talked about boxes from Germany that they had, uh, local uh, outfits that had kind of more of a boxy, again, more of the earth roamer kind of feel. But we just loved the look of the Econoline and that classic body. And it wasn't only the look, it was the canyons that we have been through yep. in, you know, Anza Borrego and Moab and stuff. And those, you know, the, the bodies that they're putting on, most of those are sticking out six to 12 inches to get yeah. the width, but it just was You're already scraping. I mean, we're yeah. getting the desert pinstripes <laughs> oh, yeah. as it yeah. is on the vehicles. So uh, so we came up with the, the idea to have a similar body. We wanted a little more room on the inside, so we flared it out, but wanted to keep the same body lines, not have it too big to, to not fit down the trails and have that the style points. And so we came up with a classic back in 2013 was the yes, first one we built. That's correct. Guy, it's been 10 years. Yeah. I can't believe that. 
Yeah. It goes fast. It does. And so we built this classic and it looks a lot like the Econoline van. And I remember the, the first Overland Expo we took it to, um, we had it parked out there and the inside wasn't even done yet. It was just right, the, the shell. Yeah. And people would be walking by it. And one day a guy comes up to me and he goes, I've walked by this thing all week and I knew something was up and I couldn't figure it out. And then it just hit me today. This is a cutaway chassis. And I was like, yeah, he goes, hi, I'm so-and-so. I don't remember his name. I'm one of the head designers for Jeep. And I was like, oh, oh I remember nice that, yeah. to meet you. And he goes, yeah. you guys hit a home run here. And I'm like, <laughs> awesome. You know, it's nice to, you know, you have all this invested in time and did we do the right thing? And then, so to have a guy like that come up and, and give his accolades, well, I, I felt pretty good. I remember that same vehicle was sitting in the showroom right here and a guy from Ford came out uh, from their, um, their approval. Yes. Yeah. And he goes, hey, I came out. I, I need to look and see what you guys are doing with the cutaway. I go, well, you're sitting next to it. And he did like a double take. goes, I thought that was in a con line. I go, that's what, that's what we want you to think. That's the idea. Yeah. But so, it is, yeah, uh, it's a little roomier. Uh, we use the fiberglass shell on the back uh, to create that extra space. And uh, we now coat it. We talked about the desert pinstriping. Not something you have to worry about now because right. all of our vans are uh, in a Raptor coating. And uh, we joked around, I think at the next expo or show that I, I bring a, a classic to, I want to put like a little GoPro on the bumper and just watch how many people touch the hood. Oh, Everyone has to yeah. walk up and lay their hands on the van. So. And the nice thing now, we don't have to, to buff it out. I don't, you don't have to wipe off clean it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just wipes clean. Yeah. So yeah, the classic, uh, I think is, you know, with all the, we mentioned all these van builders, there's hundreds of them out there now. But there's only one company that's still building on the Econoline and, uh, as awesome as the sprinters and the transits and the Chevy vans, uh, when we do these expos, it, it's that classic that really sets us apart and, and, the thing is for and the draws people in. Yeah, the customers for that classic, it's a tool and it's different. And a lot of people need that capability. Yeah. You know, a Whether lot of people want capacity, it, but right. there's a lot of people that need it. So when we first started doing the four wheel drive vans with Pathfinder and with Quigley, I think our number one customer base back then from an occupational standpoint was photographers. Mm -hmm. because these guys needed to get out there. Their equipment back then was heavier than a cell phone sure. now. I mean, yeah. they had a lot of gear and it would take them. Uh, in fact, when we started doing that, there was it wasn't even digital. It was all film mm -hmm. and they'd be out there for maybe two or three days trying to get that sunset or trying to get that shot. And they didn't want to keep going back and forth to their hotel and everything. They could actually set up on site and spend the night out there, but then they had to get back, so. Yeah, well, yeah and golden hour is usually oh, early and late. Oh, yeah. And so being able just to be right there and not have to wake up extra early to traverse out there in the early hours to yeah, get their shots. Yeah, I remember shots. one of our customers, one of the first ones, uh, John Sexton. I think he was uh, Ansel Adams' apprentice for years and everything. Yeah. And I think he's still shooting film now. It's funny, actually. I think he's on his fifth van from us. Fifth he or is. Six. I, I, I grabbed this as one of his. It was from John Sexton. Oh, okay. Uh, he sent uh, some photos of the rallies. And uh, yeah, here's some. Uh, you can see that's one of the Utah rallies, it looks like. Um, well, that was in Moab, yeah. Yep, yeah, Moab. So, yeah, 100 vans lined up going down the trails. And then uh, he also had had this picture of the... John took those? He took those. This okay. one, I don't know who took this one, but this was on check-in for the Olympic rally. And that was pretty cool. So now we have a shop here in Fresno. We also have another location in Reno where you've now moved in. How's that going? How's retirement in Reno? Uh, well, one of our goals over the 30 years of building vans was to be one of our own customers. And now we are. Because we get all these people come in, oh, I went here, I went to Alaska, I did this. And we're like, well, we did these 12 shows this year. Yeah, that's probably and the hardest part of working the job is having the people come back with like their stories of where they've been. And you're like, oh, I just I just want to be out there in the van. Yeah, and we'd still camp, but it's like, you know, we'd drive six hours to get there. We'd camp for two days, drive six hours back. It was more, it, it wasn't work. as relaxing as it is now. So we're doing yeah. a lot of good camping now. Spent a lot of time, uh, five weeks up in Canada, which was pretty epic. Awesome. And so getting to, getting to be one of our own customers and uh, yeah, the two vans that I have, the red one is a regular body Ford, a Conline 4x4 and uh, mom calls that my man purse <laughs> because every time we go somewhere, I want to take the van because I have all my stuff with me. Yeah. It's just like 
that thing is stocked. Yeah. Yeah. You've yeah. got that thing dialed in. Yeah. Yeah. I could stay out for weeks in that. <laughs> if the roads are closed, if it's snowing, if the hotels are booked, if you know, there's no food in the rat, whatever. It's yeah. just you got it's just comfortable having all my stuff with me. Ready for everything. Yeah. Yeah. So what is like your most memorable trip in the van? Ooh, there's so many. But I, and, and I don't like repeating trips because there's so many things to do and not enough time to do them. But one of the ones that I would repeat, but I don't even know if you can do it now, is Canyon du mm -hmm. It's part of the Grand Canyon. It's on an Indian reservation. We took five vans and drove uh, through the canyon for three days. And to be able to do that, you have to hire an Indian guide because it's on the reservation and they go with you. Uh -huh. And we hired a guide and she camped with us. She showed up for three days with a bag of fruit, oranges and stuff and a sleeping bag. And obviously with our vans, we cooked and took really good <laughs> care of her, yeah. uh, but learned a lot. And that was a real interesting history lesson uh, with the Indians and how they survived in that canyon and the trials and tribulations that they went through and some of the biggest changes that she's seen over her lifetime. And to be a guide, you have to be born on the reservation. And I think there were only like 20 guides left, wow. but I think they might have shut that canyon down from uh, vehicle travel now. I'm not real sure, but that was an epic trip. That was, that was good. And Baja mainland Mexico, which I wouldn't do now, but we did it uh, and went down to Batapilas, uh, Copper Canyon, a little city down at the bottom of the canyon. And real, that was, that was a pretty good trip. And uh, so if you're kind of new to this and you haven't been as many places as you've been and maybe you don't have the time to hit everything, what is like one place that you think is a must go? Mm -hmm. I'd say the state of Utah, that, yeah. that state you can bounce around there for years and not see everything. Yeah. And that's pretty epic. So Pacific Northwest, it depends where you live. Yeah, no, that's true. But, uh, the Pacific Northwest is great. Canada is great. Baja is over the top. But I, I could echo Utah. So you, you and mom watched our kids for two weeks this summer and uh, I got to take uh, my wife, Aubrey, uh, out in the van and she had never been to Arches and through Utah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I remember being parked there is right at sunset and she's just looking out and it's like, this looks like a post, it doesn't even look, it's like Disneyland. It didn't like the rocks, this doesn't even look real. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it is amazing out there. Yeah, and those photos, they don't do it justice. Doesn't do they it justice. really don't. No, we were taking tons of photos and you get back and you're like, it's like, it, it just it's, it looks like this, but way better. Yeah, yeah way more in, insane. Yeah. So there, there's, there's probably a good 10 epic camp spots on the West Coast that yeah. you gotta go to. Yeah, you yeah, Utah, to. That, that's a good one. And what about, is there one place that you haven't been yet, kind of your bucket list? Um, I know yeah. you've checked most of them off, right? But Yeah, Alaska. So a lot of, you know, the last frontier, a lot of customers said, oh, you gotta go to Alaska. Uh -huh. And you need a minimum, we've been told, of five weeks. So we actually carved out five weeks a couple of years ago to go up there. Week three, we're still in Canada. Canada is massive. And it's like we had it the trip pretty much planned, but you know, you get to Whistler and it's like, we're gonna spend a day here. Well, no, it's three days. You get Jasper, uh, it's another three days. So three weeks into it, we're still in, we're not even halfway there. And we're like, this is not gonna happen. So, and that was pretty good because we put the vans on a ferry and went over to Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island is pretty cool. That island has, it's actually bigger than Great Britain. Doesn't look like it on the map because Canada is so massive, but it's, it's bigger than Great Britain. It's only got a population of I think about 300,000. Mm -hmm. And we went tip to tip, side to side, and that is a neat island to go explore. And that's, I think my favorite thing about the van camping is kind of what you described. You had plans, you were gonna go to Alaska, <laughs> but halfway there, you're like, man, this place is cool. Let's divert here. Let's go there. You can make changes on the fly. You don't have flight reservations. I, maybe you have a campground reservation here we, or there. But We went up there for five weeks and didn't have one reservation. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Is, it was the same with Aubrey and I going back east, you know, or back to Colorado this summer. Uh, 
yeah, we did some white water, had no plans, white water rafted, went to arches, we caught a baseball game. I mean, it was just do whatever you want, stay wherever you want. And, uh, yeah, the, the full freedom that the van provides. Is, yeah. And that's is one thing awesome. about Canada too. We couldn't just pull off the road. You pull off a dirt road and like 50 yards in, there's a metal gate, had to do a lot of camp grounds and camp sites. And back East is kind of the same way. A lot of private land where, you know, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, you know, Idaho, Idaho, all the all the stuff out here. Yeah, you can still just wing it as you open. go. You know, you just yeah. wherever oh, yeah. you happen to, you end up getting yeah. a campground there and and go. Yeah, there it's it just gives you that freedom. It really does. So Alaska, that's the the next big trip. Got to do Alaska, and I think the only way we're going to do it is go to Bellingham, put the van on the Inland Passage ferry, go up there because that way we know we're going to get there and then meander our way back. Get our way back. In Newfoundland, we gotta we gotta go over there and check that out. That's awesome. A lot of people like that. Well, thanks for all the stories, uh, all the knowledge. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to kind of recap a lot of this stuff and and just talk. It it brings up so many good memories. Well, you don't usually ask me to tell stories because you've heard them so many times. And my thing <laughs> is, I like they're good stories, and I like to hear them again. But they are. You've heard them yeah, all. I've, I have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. You got me the other day on a new one. I forget what it was. But yeah. Every now and then. <laughs> well, but, I'll tell yeah. it again. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed these stories and maybe it brought up some memories of some of the times you've had in your van, feel free to leave us a comment or send us a message in our DMs. We'd love to hear about your adventures and some of the memories that you have uh, related to your van travels. Mm-hmm.